Well, please open your Bible at Romans and chapter 7 again. Last week, we began a series on what Christians believe about the law and about grace and about uh, the Christian life. We're looking at Romans and chapter 7, one of the most important, I believe, and also, I think, one of the least understood chapters of the Bible. We've set out three objectives for this short series. The first, which was our focus last week, was to better grasp the central doctrine of union with Jesus Christ, that through the bond of faith, a Christian believer is actually made one with Jesus Christ, one with Him in His death, one with Him in His resurrection. And as we looked at the opening verses of Romans and chapter 7, we thought about, using Paul's illustration there, our relationship with the law as if it were a marriage. And we gave the law uh, a name because it's being personified here as if it were a person. We called it nomos. And we saw that to be married to nomos um, would be to be married to a very demanding person, never pleased, never satisfied. And yet Paul says this is actually the position that all of us are in by nature. Uh, We're actually born into this miserable marriage, this bound to the law, and the only way out of this miserable marriage to nomos uh, is death itself. And since the law never dies, um, that leaves us in uh, a rather sorry state. Then we saw the good news. For those who are in Jesus Christ, it actually is true that you did die. You died and you rose in Jesus Christ, and in this way and for this reason, you are released from the miserable marriage to the law, and more than that, brought into a new and a marvelous union, and this is why we call the series The Second Marriage, or A Second Marriage, that by God's grace, you're brought into a new and a marvelous union with Jesus Christ, in which you are made one with Him. You are loved in this union. It is a marvelous union. It is a union in which you are able to flourish. And all of this we saw in Romans chapter 7 and verse 4, which was our key verse last week. Likewise, my brothers, you also have died to the law. And how did it happen? Through the body of Christ, you died with Christ. And why did it happen? So that you may belong to another, so that you may enter into this new and wonderful union that is with him who was raised from the dead in order that we might bear fruit for God. Now, that's the start that we made in this little series uh, last week, and today we're going to focus in on the second objective, which is that we would better understand the human condition and therefore see why a sustained attempt at a moral life cannot be the answer. To better understand the human condition, that is, the condition into which all of us are born, the natural condition of every human being, we want to understand that better so that we will more clearly see why it is that a sustained attempt at a moral life cannot be the answer. So, we pick it up today at Romans chapter 7 and verse 7. What shall we say then? That the law is sin by no means. Now, very obviously, this is the question that naturally would arise from everything that we said looking at these first six verses last week. If being bound to nomos is a miserable marriage, if nomos, as we saw last time, kind of beats up on you, doesn't it sound then like you are saying, Paul, doesn't it sound like this chapter is saying that the law is actually a bad thing and not a good thing? Now, that is what any thinking person would ask, having taken seriously um, what is said in Romans chapter 7 and verses 1 to 6. And I'm greatly encouraged that many of you are obviously thinking persons because many of you actually asked me precisely that question after the message last week, which I said, where to go? That is exactly the question that anyone who takes Romans chapter 7, verses 1 to 6 seriously will ask, are you therefore saying that the law is a bad thing? And so, Paul raises that question and immediately answers it, and he says, no way, no way. 
By the way, this is a pattern in the letters of the Apostle Paul, and especially in the book of Romans, where Paul makes a case, and then he raises and answers the questions that would arise from the case that he has just made. And one of the ways in which you know that you have correctly understood the Apostle Paul as you read through Romans is, if you're asking the question that he asks next, you have clearly understood and rightly understood what he just said before. Perhaps the clearest and most important example of this is in Romans in chapter 5, because in that chapter, the Apostle Paul sets out the marvelous truth of justification by faith. He makes the argument in Romans 5 that your salvation does not rest on anything that you do for God, but on what God in Jesus Christ has done for you. The natural question from anyone who understands Romans in chapter 5 is therefore to say, so, does that mean that we could just go on sinning and it doesn't make any difference? I mean, if it all rests on what Jesus has done for us and it's not on what we've done for Him, isn't that the logical conclusion? And you see, that is precisely the question that the Apostle Paul raises in Romans chapter 6 and verse 1. What shall we say there? then, shall we continue in sin so that grace may abound? And of course, he gives the answer, by no means. And then he explains the answer by introducing us to this wonderful doctrine of union with Jesus Christ, which is our focus in this series. It begins in chapter 6, and it runs through into Romans in chapter 7. You are made one with Jesus Christ in His death and in His resurrection. You're a new person. You cannot go back to what you were before because you are not what, where, what you were before. Now, notice, therefore, that we have the same pattern when we come to Romans chapter 7 and verse 7. Uh, it has seemed uh, from all that we have learned about how miserable it is to be bound to nomos, uh, does that then mean that the law is a bad thing? Verse 7, what shall we then say that the law is sin? By no means. By no means. So now we're going to come to this very important subject, what then is a proper Christian view of the law of God? And the answer is in verse 12. It's very clear there. The law is holy, and the commandment is holy and righteous and good. The commandments are holy, righteous, and good, of course, first because they were given by God Himself, and they are a reflection of His holy, righteous, and good character. They lay out for us the way of life that is holy and righteous and good. When God gave the law, He gave a wonderfully good gift to His people. Uh, just think for a moment how wonderful this city of Chicago would be if everyone lived according to the law of God. God says, you shall not murder, you shall not kill. How marvelous this city of Chicago would be if this summer there were no murders. How marvelous it would be for doing business in the city of Chicago if it were the case that everyone had received and obeyed the law of God, uh, you shall not steal, uh, you shall not bear false witness. If in business you could trust every word that is spoken by everyone that you are doing business with, and you could be absolutely certain that no one would ever lay claim to something unless it truly was rightfully theirs. What a marvelous, marvelous world this would be if that were the case. God's law is good. And Paul lays out here two particular ways in which the law is good. The first is, in verse 7, that the law is good because it reveals sin. If it had not been for the law, I would not have known sin. Now, I think that of all the questions I've been asked in casual conversation in the last 20 years, and it still comes up, um, Questions about, you know, moving from the UK to the US, even though it's many, many years ago. The number one question that I'm still asked to this day is, how do you get on driving on the right side of the road? 
Uh, to which one good answer would be, you know, it's okay because someone told me that that's what you have to do. Now, if, if you know, it's really good to know these things. Now, if you go to, uh, to Britain or to Australia or one of these other countries where they get it the wrong way around, if that's the way for me to say it, you might be very glad uh, to see a sign uh, that tells you uh, drive uh, on uh, the left. It is a, a very gracious thing. Um, to be told that this is actually what you have to do. If someone doesn't tell you that, you're, you're for sure going to be in trouble if you don't know what the law is. I'm actually very thankful for the Illinois uh, rules of the road um, because there are several quite distinct differences. I mean, in the UK, you cannot turn um, uh, on a, 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 a red light. Uh, here it's right there that it would be left, of course. You, you, you can't do that. You're not supposed to do that unless there's a filter. So, a lot of things that are different, you, and it's a good thing to be told. And I tell you, I'm so thankful to God that the, the law of God was actually written in tablets of stone, that it doesn't ever change, and therefore we do know where we are, and we're not in some unpredictable situation. I mean, thinking about driving, um, here's a sign coming up on the screen, you do not want to see. Drive on the left on Mondays, drive on the right on, on Tuesdays, that's absolute chaos. Thank God that He has given us His law, that He's revealed what the right way is, and that it never changes. Now, the law is good. It's a wonderful good gift because it tells us what a righteous life actually looks like. Nobody wants to go through life thinking that we're getting it right, and then on the last day suddenly discovering, because nobody told us, that when we stand before God, we, we, we find that we got it completely wrong. Thank God that we have the law because it's a good thing that it reveals sin. And secondly, Paul makes this argument that the law is good because it actually promised life. Do you notice this in verse 10? He speaks about the commandment that promised life. Remember, the rich young ruler came to Jesus. What do I have to do to get eternal life? And Jesus says, well, you know the commandments. So, he says, yes, I do. And he begins to recite them. And you remember what Jesus said to him? He said, do these and you will live. Do these and you will live. Life in all of its fullness would lie ahead of a person who lived according to all the commandments of God. So, the law is good, wonderfully good. And the apostle is making this point, and it's a very important point. It's good for multiple reasons. Uh, one is that it reveals sin. Another is that it promises life. It tells us of what God requires of us, and it comes with this marvelous promise for those who keep it. The law is not the problem. So, what is the problem? What makes our position miserable in the way that we described it last week. The law is not the problem, sin is. Now, that's where we're going to focus our attention for the rest of the time uh, today. Martin Lloyd-Jones says about Romans chapter 7, it is beyond doubt the profoundest analysis of sin of its ways and of its results, which is to be found anywhere in the whole of Scripture. And for that reason, this is the chapter that perhaps more than any other will help you to understand yourself, your own experience, your own need, and why the gospel is the greatest good news that any person has ever heard or will hear. Now, I want us very simply from these verses then to draw out what sin is, what it does, and where it leads. First then, what sin is. If you were to do some man-in-the-street interviews and ask people simply the question, what is sin? You'd get all kinds of answers these days, of course, but one answer that you would get for sure is that sin is doing bad things, like lying and stealing cheating, and so forth and so on. But here's what I want you to grasp from the Bible today. Sin is more than doing bad things. 
And if you only understand sin in terms of actions, you have not yet understood its nature. Sin is a power or an impulse that by nature actually resides in our hearts. And here's why that is so important. Let me give you some examples of what happens if that truth is not grasped. You see, this is the big truth that was missed by the Pharisees. And it's actually still the big truth that is missed by many, many people in Christian churches today. Remember, the Pharisees were committed to living a model life. They were absolutely serious about avoiding sin. The problem for the Pharisees was that their definition of sin was limited only to evil actions. So that's why when Jesus told a story about a Pharisee, remember the Pharisee who went into the temple to pray, and he could honestly say to God, well, now I don't steal. And, you know, I really do give myself to prayer. In actual fact, I, I fast twice a week. That's probably more than most of us here do. And I give 10% not only of what I earn, but of everything that I receive, of, of everything. I, I, I do this. And, and so the Pharisee comes into the presence of God and is able to itemize these particular actions. Here's what I do. Here is what I don't do. I'm absolutely committed to a moral life. And, and here's a catalog of what I've done and of what I have not done. The rich young ruler, you remember, to whom we referred a moment ago, was working with exactly the same definition, inadequate definition of sin. He thought of it simply in terms of actions. So when Jesus says to him, now what are the commands? He reels them off. Honor your father and mother, do not murder, and so forth and so on. And then he says, I've done them. All these things I have done since I was a youth. See, Jesus, I'm committed to living a good moral life. He's in exactly the same place as the Pharisee in the temple. Why? Because he's working with a definition of sin that is limited simply to outward actions. Now, here's what's fascinating. When the apostle Paul was converted, after that, he was able to look back on his earlier life. And looking back on his earlier life before his conversion, he identified that he was actually living with the same pattern. And he tells us about it in Philippians chapter 3 and verse 4. He says, if anyone else thinks that they have reason for confidence in the flesh, then I have more. As to righteousness under the law, he says, I was blameless. In other words, Paul is saying, looking back on my earlier life, if you asked me, was I a person who lied, cheated, and stole? The honest answer to that question is no. I lived a moral life. But the next thing that he says is hugely significant in Philippians in chapter 3. He says, whatever gain I had, having just referred to his moral life, I count it as loss for the sake of Jesus Christ. You see what he's saying? Being a model person actually kept me back from seeing my need of Jesus Christ. It actually blinded me, Paul is saying, to my own need. Now, friends, this is hugely important for us because in overwhelming measure in this congregation, we are people who are committed to living a moral life. We raise our children to live moral lives. And it is very hard for a person who is committed to living a moral life to really grasp that he or she is a sinner. So that every time we hear about forgiveness and the grace of God, we're always glad to hear it, and we always think about other people. It's our first instinct. If you are a moral person, I say to you, it will take a miracle of grace for you to come to a place where you really see the extent of your own need before God. And I am praying that that miracle of grace will happen for some of us here today. And it begins, that miracle of grace, with settling in your mind that sin is a lot more than wrong actions. 
It really is. You think that, you're with the Pharisees. You're not with the Bible. Now, this was actually crucial in the great transformation that came about in the life of the Apostle Paul himself. And he actually refers to it right here back in Romans in chapter 7. Look at verse 7. If it had not been for the law, I would not have known sin. For I would not have known what it is to covet if the law had not said, you shall not covet. Now, Paul is speaking personally here. And what he says to us is, the one that got me was the tenth commandment. That's the one that says, you shall not covet. Now, why the Tenth Commandment? Why was that the one that got him when he thought, measuring himself against the other nine, that he was really doing quite well? The reason that the Tenth Commandment was the one that got him is that the Tenth Commandment speaks not to actions, but to the heart. You shall not covet. Coveting is a desire, a hidden desire, an inner desire of the heart. In other words, the 10th commandment, you see, really anticipates the teaching of our Lord Jesus. You remember in the Sermon on the Mount when He spoke um, about the commandments and uh, laid them out, what, what, what He made clear was that actually all of the commandments actually go not only to specific actions, but to the intents of the heart. That is why the sixth commandment, do not murder, Jesus says, well, I'll tell you where that goes. That goes to not even being angry with your brother. And the seventh commandment that says, do not commit adultery, uh, Jesus says, I'll tell you where that goes. Where that one goes is not even to look with lustful intent upon another person. So, Paul says the 10th commandment was the one that really blew open the categories. I'd lived with this idea that I was doing well because my definition of sin is its actions only. Then the 10th commandment came and it got me. It really did. It slayed me. That's really what he says. I realized that I was actually working on the wrong definition of sin. I had limited it to certain actions that I do not do. There I was with my moral checklist. I never murdered anybody. I don't rob banks and so forth and so on. Then one day I came face to face with the 10th commandment. And when I saw that sin includes the very impulses of my heart and that God regards the impulses of my heart in terms of sin as much as if they were turned into the full action, then I could no longer regard myself as a moral person who was doing rather well. And I had to completely change what I had previously imagined my own position to be. Sin is a power. It's an impulse in the heart. It gravitates towards that which God forbids. It's in all of our nature. And it's what every one of us needs saving from. Grasp this and it will deliver you from being a Pharisee. And it's right here in Romans chapter 7. Now, that's what sin is. Second thing he focuses us out on is what sin does. And I want you to notice the three activities of sin here that are very clearly laid out for us. Sin produces, it deceives, and it kills. First then, sin produces. Look at verse 8. Sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, produced in me all kinds of covetousness. Now, the word produced is the really important word here. Think of a fire, and it's producing flames, and it's throwing up sparks. Think of a fountain uh, throwing up water. 
That's the picture here, producing a bubbling spring. Something is coming from it. And sin is this impulse in the heart, and it's always producing some new line of thought, some new uh, idea, some, some new desire that, that is grieving to the very Spirit of God. We call this temptation. And what we're learning here, as we learn very often in the Bible, is that it actually comes from within. James, in chapter 1, he says each person is tempted when um, he is lured and enticed by his own evil desire. It, it actually resides within us and there comes out from us. And Jesus said this so very clearly in Mark's gospel in chapter 7. It's from within. It's out of the heart of man, our Lord Jesus says, that come evil thoughts and sexual immorality and theft and murder and adultery and coveting and deceit and wickedness and sensuality and envy and slander and pride and foolishness. All of these evils, he says it again, they come from within and they defile a person. Dr. Al Mohler said this so wonderfully clearly and well. He says, the culture is always telling us that the problem's out there and the answer's in here. The Bible says exactly the opposite. The Bible says the problem's in here and the answer's out there in Jesus Christ. That's a complete inversion of what the culture is saying to you each and every day, that the problem actually resides within the human heart. And this condition into which we are born, in which sin is resident within us. This is so countercultural, but it is absolutely clear here in the Bible. Now, think about all the implications of this. You see, as parents, we rightly want to protect our children from the many, many evils that there are out there in the world. But if you grasp what our Lord is saying in these Scriptures that we've just quoted, then you will see that the bigger problem for your children, the bigger problem is actually the impulse within, the impulse that resides in the child's heart and resides in your heart to bend away from that which is pleasing to God and to seek after that which arises from this fountain that resides in our heart. Think about this in your own experience. These moods, that sudden sharp word, where did it come from? It was so hurtful to another person. Why did I say that? It comes from within. That's what we're, we're learning here. The impulse of sin produced out of your own heart. Sin produces, that's what he says, produces. Secondly, sin deceives. Look at verse 11. Sin seizing an opportunity through the commandment deceived me, and through it killed me. Now, this goes back to the Garden of Eden, of course, where uh, Eve said, the serpent deceived me. Sin has an allure. It, uh, every temptation obviously holds an attraction. It holds a promise of happiness, but sin deceives. It always makes promises, and it never keeps them. And sin deceives both in the prospect that it offers and in the outcome that it conceals. The prospect that sin offered to Eve was, you shall be as God. Wouldn't you like that? Why wouldn't you want that? To be the Lord of your own life. Why would you want God running your life when you could be running your life? You could be doing it yourself. This is your life. Why shouldn't you be your own God? There's sin deceiving in the prospect. Take the evil as well as the good. Try it. Then, once you've tasted both sides, then you can make up your mind which one you like the more. That was the very first temptation. And so, when Eve 
tasted the fruit that she had been commanded by the Lord God not to eat, she found then that she'd been deceived because she didn't become God. She became a sinner. Sin deceives us with the prospect that it offers. It tells us it'll lead us one place. It takes us entirely different place. And it also deceives in regards to the outcome that it conceals. Remember the woman in that story, right at the beginning of the Bible, says to the serpent, God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the middle of the garden, lest you die. Now, that's going to be the outcome, says Eve. Don't want that. That's why I'm not going to do that. And what does the serpent say? You're not going to die. You are not going to die. You will not surely die. So, sin deceives because it conceals the outcome. It closes your eyes to where it will lead you. And so, the impulse or the inclination to sin in you will produce these two deceptions. So, watch for this. If I do this, I will be happy. That's the deception over the prospect. And if I do this, I will still be just okay. Nothing will, bad will happen to me. That's the deception over the outcome. See, sin is a powerful in, impulse. Why is it that we would struggle with going back to do again something that made us miserable when we did it before. There is absolutely no logic to that. And there's only one explanation as to why that is so common in human experience, and that is that sin deceives. It just puts the blinders on and lies to us over the prospect. It's going to make you happy this time. And lies to us over the result. It will not do you any harm. So, what sin is, it's more than actions, it's, it's this inner impulse that's very powerful. And what does this inner impulse do? Well, it, it deceives us. Then something else it does, it, it kills. That's the third thing. Look at verse 11. For sin seizing an opportunity through the commandment deceived me and through it killed me. So, sin produces, and sin deceives, and then sin kills. Um, sin works. It sucks the life out of you. It kills the ability to love. It deadens responsiveness towards God. Sin puts you in the position that Jesus spoke about when he says, their hearts have become dull. Sin puts you in a position where you could come to church and hear the truth for a thousand weeks and not be different. Because your heart's dull. That's what it does. It kills. Sin puts you in a position, Jesus used these words, where you honor God, that is, you say all the right things about God, but actually your heart is far from Him. And what's so fascinating is that Jesus said these words about people who were made the custodians of the law, committed to a moral life, but a really dull heart, and saying all the right things about God, but not really loving Him a heart that is far from Him. So, here is what sin does. It is this impulse of rebellion against God, and it produces, and it deceives, and it kills. And that brings us to the last thing. See, what I said earlier that Romans 7 is perhaps the most profound analysis of what sin is and what its effects are anywhere in the Bible. Um, and the third thing here is where sin leads. 
It leads first to confusion and second to frustration. Um, first confusion in verse 15, I do not understand my own actions. If all you have is an attempt to live a model life, if all you have is the law, you will always be a mystery to yourself. You won't be able to make any sense of what you do or of why you do it. You will live in confusion and you will live, if all you have is the law, an attempt to live a moral life, you will live in frustration. Verse 24, very famous words, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? If all you have is a sustained attempt to live a moral life, that is where you will be in confusion and in frustration. A sustained attempt to live a moral life cannot change who you are. And honestly, friends, becoming religious won't do it either. Praying, fasting, solitude, serving, giving back to the community. None of these things has the power to deal with this impulse of sin in you that produces and that deceives and that kills. So, morality cannot be the answer. That's the conclusion from this teaching in Romans in chapter 7. Morality cannot be the answer. In other words, if we, as a church, were to call people to morality but not lead them to Jesus Christ, all we would do is bring them into confusion and frustration. You have to understand that. If the message of the church to the nation is a call back to morality and we do not get to Jesus Christ, all we do is lead people into confusion and into frustration. That's where Romans in chapter 7 uh, takes us on this subject. Morality cannot be the answer. You know what calling a lost world to morality is like? It's like calling a man who is dying of lung cancer to stop smoking when the damage has already been done. That's what it is. It doesn't deal with the problem. call to morality alone will only lead people to a life of saying, O oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Parents need to understand this. If the message of parents to our children is simply a call to morality, do the right thing, live a good life, son, you are setting your children up for confusion and frustration, and you're actually watering the seeds of rebellion that are already there in their own heart. You have to grasp and explain to your children this truth of the Bible of indwelling sin, how it produces, how it deceives, how it kills, how it is in them, and how it is in you as well. Then you're getting to the issue. And then you'll be leading them to Jesus Christ. There's only one way to deal with this impulse of sin that is so destructive. And it's not to try harder and to live a better life next week. It is to become a new creation. It is what is at the very core of this series, this less understood truth that we really need to grasp. You have to die and rise with Jesus Christ. It's through this second marriage in which you die to the law and you're brought into a new and a living union with Jesus Christ. You become, to use the Bible's language, a new creation in Jesus Christ. 
That's why it's so wonderful that Romans chapter 7, this marvelous and really important chapter, does not end in verse 24, saying, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? He gives an answer to that problem. If I just had the law, that's where I'd be left, but I have more than the law. Thanks be to God, Jesus Christ our Lord. Thank God that being a Christian is more than a sustained attempt at living a moral life. Thank God that being a Christian is more than believing in Jesus and trying harder. Thank God that being a Christian at its heart is this wonderful union with Jesus Christ in which His life actually comes into you. His Spirit actually lives within you. And friends, we're going to look in the last part of the series at what that life in union with Jesus actually looks like. But for today, I just want to end with this appeal. I am increasingly burdened, increasingly burdened, as the years in which I've known many people go on. For dear folks, in our congregation whose best understanding of Christianity is that it is a sustained effort to live a moral life. I'm burdened for you. You've seen that Jesus can forgive what you've done, but you have not yet seen that Jesus Christ can change what you are. And so you languish. You come to church faithfully, then you go out with this white-knuckled attempt to live a better life next week than the life that you lived this last week. But actually what you experience is not the presence of Jesus Christ in your life and His Holy Spirit that we're going to look at next week, but you just live in constant confusion and constant frustration. And I want to say to you today, you may think you know what Christianity is because you've been brought up with it. I'm saying to you today that Jesus Christ is able to do for you what you cannot do for yourself. So come and confess to Him today that your best attempts at change on the outside can't change what you are on the inside. Cast yourself on the mercy of this wonderful Lord Jesus Christ and ask Him to bind you to Himself and to make you a new creation. And by His grace and His mercy to indwell you and to give to you the gift of His Holy Spirit. Look to Him. Put your trust in Him. And hope will begin for you in Jesus Christ. Christ today. Father, please open eyes that have not seen this marvelous and central truth before that today and this weekend may be the time of new beginnings and of the entrance of of your Son and your Holy Spirit and your presence into the lives of many so that in union with Christ we may enter into all that the Son of God came into the world to redeem us for. And we ask these things together in the Savior's name. Amen. Surprise, respond.